Um, so thanks so much to all of you for being here. Um, I'm Lisa Williams. I'm one of the co-founders of What's Your Grief? And I think many of you are familiar with What's Your Grief, but for those of you who are not, um, we are a grief and bereavement support organization. We operate primarily online, but we're based in Baltimore, Maryland, and we do some things in person in, in Baltimore as well. Um, but we founded back in 2012, really for a couple of different reasons. We um, founded because Eleanor Haley, my co-founder, and I uh, were both working, supporting people who had experienced traumatic and unexpected deaths in Baltimore. Um, but we had also been through our own losses, and we were really struggling to find grief support online that really captured some of our own uh, experiences with the ways that we were coping with grief in our own lives, especially in kind of creative ways. And also for the people who we were working with, who were looking for things that were different than just traditional therapy and support groups. And um, the online space was very different 10 years ago. And so we founded What's Your Grief to kind of be a space that we could um, do things that felt a little bit like more like they were consistent with kind of what, how we found ourselves grieving and what we wanted to give our clients. And I share that history about what's your grief in part as a way to introduce uh, Jimmy Edmonds and Jane Harris, who were so, so, so excited to be doing this with today. Um, Jimmy and Jane were in the early days of what's your grief some of the first people who we really connected with online, who we felt this real sort of kinship with because of the ways that they were using creative expression in such um, incredible and uh, really just, I think, innovative ways, but to be able to capture things about their own grief and their own loss, which I know they will say a lot more about. Um, and so from the very beginning of What's Your Grief, I have just always been uh, so excited to be able to follow what the Good Grief Project, what Jimmy and, and Jane have done over the years. They have done so much with different films, not just the film that is um, going to be screened here today. Um, and when we share the follow-up email afterwards, we will share links to lots of the other things that, um, that, that Jane and Jimmy have done that they may mention. They have also put out an incredible new book, which I um, bought immediately as soon as I saw that it was coming out called When Words Are Not Enough that is all about creative responses to grief and really taps in to the ways that they have worked with so many people over the years in their work now bringing people together for retreats in the UK that um, really help people to connect with their creative responses and creative ways of grieving and this book it captures so much of what they've done and what people do to use creativity for grief. So I'm just really excited uh, to be able to actually do this together after so many years and to be able to give all of you who've been able to join a chance to um, see some of the work that uh, Jimmy and Jane have created in this film and, and learn about their other work. So with all of that, I am going to turn over um, to Jane and Jimmy to talk more about um, the film and give a little introduction, and then we will get started. At the end, we will do a Q&A um, after the film wraps up. Please hold your comments, um, your questions, I should say, for the, the Q&A until the end. So if you share, you know, anything throughout, we, we won't be able to follow that. So what we're going to do is just hold that. So try not to forget, make yourself a note if you have a question that you want to ask them at the end, and we'll be taking those questions afterwards. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn over to Jane and Jimmy and um, let them introduce the film. 
Thank you so much, Litsa and Eleanor. We're so honored to be here and talking to this audience from all around the world, it seems. It's an absolute privilege to do this. And as you say, Litsa, you know, like you, our lives have been transformed by grief. It's been a long, hard journey and a similar length of time for us as for you. But the film that we're going to watch tonight is very much about that journey. It is a road trip. It is a journey. It is about change. It's about loneliness and isolation. And we really welcome your questions and comments afterwards because, you know, it's 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 not often that people get to kind of engage like this around this difficult subject. And there's still a, a, a terribly noisy silence around the subject of grief. So... We look forward to your questions and answers and answering your questions at the end. But as I say, thank you so much for welcoming us and hosting us. Jimmy, do you want to just say something? About I, I could say I, I was very interested to hear what you were saying, Litsa, about the value of um, uh, various different creative responses to grief. Um, uh, to tell you the truth, um, um, it, it's only something that's come to us in the last few years that we've realised that what we're actually doing is processing grief by making and doing things, things that would not have ex would not have existed unless our boy Josh had died. Um, and that's how we've come to this realisation that um, our, our own grief is uh, almost by definition, if you like, uh, a creative process. Um, um, uh, uh, and the, the film really was 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 effectively part of that. We were we were needing to find ways to um, what we could say is to make Josh's death real, um, because unless unless we'd done that, we would forever be sort of wandering around in some kind of limbo. Um, uh, and in I, I'd started by making some photographs and uh, and producing a, a, a small book, but. The, the major part of our work together really has been about um, about, about making films uh, 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 with other people, but it's also about making our Josh's death real. It's about making our grief real and being in, in sort of tangible connection with it um, because um, it's very easy, um, um, or at least ways it has been for me anyway, to try and step, step aside from, from, from the process and to step aside because it's a very painful process um, and um, it's, 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 it's all too easy to try and negate that, to say that actually, no, this thing isn't affecting me as much as people think it is or that I think it is and the rest of it. So doing the things that we're doing, making films, um, producing the book that you've spoken about and also um, sharing that experience with other people in our active grief weekends is really all about um, the uh, uh, of making uh, 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 making a much more tangible connection both with Josh and our grief. Um, so, um, and we learned a lot of that in America while we were making the film "The Love That Never Dies." We learned, you know, because that's that's another thing about. Um, the business of, uh, of sharing and communicating your feelings with other people, especially bereaved parents or siblings. And um, you should know that I know that your audience is probably a, a wider audience than just bereaved parents and siblings. This film is specifically about um, our conversations with other bereaved parents and what it's like to suffer the death of a, of a child. And interestingly, the difference with the book is that that is actually much broader in terms of relating to bereaved couples, siblings, um, parents, children. Uh, we, we broadened it out because um, our learning meant that we really needed to be as inclusive and, in and intentional as possible. So we look forward to your questions afterwards. But I think what's lovely about this is this is all about relationship and everything about the filmmaking, the process we've gone through, it's about relationship and it's about connection more than anything else. And that is what grief is all about. So we look forward to seeing you after the film. And thank you again, Litsa and Eleanor, and what's your grief? We are so in admiration of what you've done too, really. Thank you. Maxi, Mac Mac. Yeah? Some people might think you're off your rocker. Time for dinner. Okay. But I had a friend that told me that when you're a bereaved mother, you get a wide latitude for craziness. 
And I always took comfort in that, that if anyone felt that it was unhealthy, you know, I could just say, I'm a bereaved mother, what do you expect? <laughs> this is Jesse, this is his namesake. We, uh, the, within our family, we just decided after he passed away that somebody's kid should carry on the name. When Josh first died, I didn't want to hear about anybody else's grief. Give me a break. I couldn't have done. I just could not have heard beyond my own pain. The thing about losing a child is it has a sort of nightmare quality to it. It's just like a loss of identity and a confusion and just a sense of disbelief. My son, Josh, is dead. The first time I laughed, I thought, what a horrible person I was to laugh when my child had died. I didn't want to enjoy anything or eat the foods that he liked or do anything because he couldn't do it. My grief is sacred. My love for my son is sacred. And the night Jordan died, we were laying there in bed and she looked at me and she said, Daniel, this is not good for our marriage. Statistically, people who lose children don't stay together. Statistically. I screamed out at one point just because here kid died doesn't make you queen over everyone else. You know, the rest of us don't have to bow down and take your shit because your kid's dead. And the self-destructive bit, what's that about for you? Wanting to die, just wanting to die, anything to stop the pain. Everybody seemed to struggle with this same question of how to fit in. And I kept thinking, isn't this mad? We're bereaved parents and yet we're desperately trying to fit in. You have to come to grips with your helplessness around it. No one can take it away. You can't bypass it. I mean, you read about this in the grief books. Lean into the grief. <laughs> and I never knew what the heck that meant. But I think I'm starting to figure it out. Each stage along the way, I've had moments, and there's a bittersweetness always present because Josh isn't here. I want him standing beside me, and I want to be able to give him a big squeeze and a big cuddle and feel his big, tall body and, you know, give it, give it a hug. Thank you so much. I, Jane and Jimmy, before we take any questions, I just wanted to give a moment now that, you know, everyone has seen the film, if there's anything you want to share as, as everyone is kind of just taking all of this in. Yeah, I've been watching the comments and I'm so moved and saddened by so much grief and loss and some people so early in their grief still traumatized and other people much much longer but the major thing that I'm left thinking is that you know we're not looking for closure we're lo looking for openings and that that has to be the most important aspect of what we're trying to do with our work with our book with our films is to start conversations. And um, I think the word we've been using recently is intentional. We take an intentional uh, approach through our films and photographs um, in remembering and learning to internalize and carry our children or our loved ones with us. And that in the beginning can seem virtually impossible, but as time goes on, things do shift. It never gets better, but it does change. And we hope that there is hope for people uh, in, 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 in our film. I'm, I'm struck by um, the, these stories as well. It seems to me that um, um, for some reason we need to have permission to grieve. And I think that um, in the comments here, the responses here, it seems as if somehow or other this film is giving people a certain permission to be more open and to to yeah to grieve for their children. Yeah, I certainly I certainly think that that is something that's so powerful in the film is just the way that you clearly open spaces for people to feel comfortable talking to you. I mean, one of the things I was really struck by is just 
the comfort of everyone speaking with the two of you in the film. And I think that's really incredible. And it just says so much about the space that you are able to create that allows people to feel this permission to be open about what the realities of grief are. And that reality that, that very few people who are grieving are looking to close that chapter. Like, you know, you shared in the, the beginning, Jimmy, it's just not something that most of us want to do. So then what does it look like when we're moving forward differently with grief. Um, one of the things, a question that came in that I um, appreciate, because I think this is so true in watching the film, is so often as people grieving, I think we watch films like this and think, oh, I wish everyone in my life who hadn't been through a loss that could watch something like this. Like, And the question that came in was this could be so powerful for so many people who have not maybe experienced at least a very close loss to understand grief and what others are going through. But how do we um, maybe inspire or motivate others <laughs> to watch a film like this and be interested in stories in this way? And um, it's a tough question, but I'm curious what, what your thoughts are. It's one of the hardest things. And in the early years after Josh died, it never left my mind. You know, I kept thinking, how do we how do we open this out? How does it not just be something that we have to address? And I think that it's incredibly complex because as most bereaved parents know, we represent people's worst nightmare. And at an unconscious level, and I don't mean this to sound airy fairy, but there is a fear of contagion. And that if people talk about it, it's going to make it happen. And in fact, much to my surprise, a really dear friend recently said to me that she didn't want to read our book because she felt it might tempt fate. Now, that's, you know, as we know, it's all said with good intention. If we watch a film like A Love That Never Dies, we might tempt fate. And when we were having our initial screening in 2018 to a packed cinema in the West End in London, the hardest thing it seemed when we talked to people was crossing the threshold to come in and watch our film because it filled people with terror. And actually what people said afterwards was it was OK I feel better. I feel relieved. We are sort of finding a language here. And I guess that's what we are trying to do. Myself and Jimmy are really committed to finding a language that is more comfortable and less isolating because we feel it's wrong that people who are bereaved and are going through hell should feel loneliness on top of trauma and pain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I know that that it's, I, I imagine that so many people who might struggle initially with the idea of watching this film for whatever reason, just for all the baggage people bring to the idea of death and grief and the fear and the anxiety, that I imagine that anyone who would see this would leave with such a different feeling than what they expected in seeing the film. And that's, um, yeah, a beautiful in what you've done. I, I see a few people ask the question of just how you became connected with and met the the families and folks who you interviewed in the film? Uh, well, we connected with Robert Neumeyer and Catherine Shear, um, both of whom are really well known in, in the States, more so than in the UK. And they helped us get in touch with people. We also had made a film for the Compassionate Friends in the UK called Say Their Name. And the clue is in the title of the film. Nobody said Josh's name in the beginning. And that's what people want. And so through the Compassionate Friends in the United States, we actually got networked in with a lot of people. And what was so interesting was that people bit our hands off to be involved because nobody really wants to talk to a bereaved parent. <laughs> people aren't queuing up to have conversations with us, believe me. And when we said, we want to hear your story, could you share? People would, they trusted us because I guess we are not into exploitative filmmaking. We're into authentic approaches to grief and loss. And it's all about respect to the certain things that haven't gone into the film because it would be too voyeuristic. It would be showing too much. So, you know, the editing, the time in the cutting room was enormously long. I mean, we had, I can't remember how many hours of content, but we were in the cutting room. Jimmy was cutting the film for how long? About a year. About a year. Um, but but and normally a, a program like that would probably take about six to eight weeks to to cut that. But um, 
um, I could only really spend uh, a few hours a day on it. It was just a little bit too intense. Um, in terms of how we managed to get our subjects was that, um, as Jane was saying, we'd been in contact with the Compassionate Friends in, in the USA. We actually had around about 60, excuse me, 60 people um, um, applying um, to you know to to be involved in the film we 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 worked out a trajectory from east to west so we started in new york and finished in um, in in san francisco over an eight week period and we were going to motor the whole way um so we divided the country up into three zones like your time zones um and invited anybody who was going to be um, who would be available at the moment in which we'd be in any one of those time zones and we worked out a trajectory from that. So from that 60, we actually invited um, 12 people to have a Zoom call with us. This was before COVID, by the way. So um, we <laughs> <laughs> none of us were that used to doing these, 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 Zoom, these Zoom calls. But uh, um, um, and from there, we, we, it was a very hard task for us to whittle down the number of people that we would then um, um, go and visit and, and interview. Um, and in the end, we interviewed 11 different families, of which um, six um, are in, in the film. Um, again, that business of editing out somebody's story is, it is quite a, it's, it's quite a difficult process. Um, and, it, and it's fraught with all sorts of um, um, difficult emotions. Um, on our website, um, there are two other stories. Um, just um, on the, if you, if you go to our website and, and look under the um, the heading for um, your stories, I think mm -hmm. it is, you'll see um, a really nice um, story from Scarlett. Um, Scarlett Lewis, whose son Jesse died in the um, um, Newton what was Sandy, it? Sandy 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 Hook. Um, massacre um in 2014 and we made a short film with her and we interviewed her as yeah. well um, um yeah and uh, uh, yeah yeah it was it was a it was it was a bit of a wrench to um to drop her from the main film because she's very good um she, she's very she's very good, good. Very, we made a very insightful about um about the power of forgiveness her um, her material's beautiful and um, you know, we spent a lot of time filming with her, so we, we made this short separate film. I'm, I'm seeing a question, a few questions about friends and, you know, changes in, 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 in networks and things. One question, did your friendship group change, I think, or did, did you, we, we found that in the early stages that was really problematic for us. Um, but as time's gone on, you know, yes, address books do change, but what is incredible is the friendships you make are so spectacular and we like every person we interviewed in the film and every person we interviewed for our book which I mentioned earlier it's like you've known people for a very long time you just get into the heart of the subject you get right to the core of what matters and I think I know certainly for me I don't want to speak for Jimmy but I think certainly the feeling is that our priorities have changed since the death of our son. What matters to us has changed. Um, what's important is different to what it was before. And, you know, sometimes people will say, I'm so glad you, you seem to be back to your old self. And I kind of have to say to that, well, I'm not. And I don't want to be. And I think, though it's been, you know, no words can describe the pain of losing your child. It's all back to front. But there is something that you discover about the depth of your capacity to survive and process the love that you have for your child that can strengthen you. And much as I hate to use language like post-traumatic growth, there is a lot of truth in that. You know, it does strengthen you. And I think people in our film talk about that. You know, there is a sense of that's what's important now. I don't want to remember how he died. I want to remember how he lived. I want to learn from my child or my loved one's death. What did they teach me? And what will I carry? What is the continuing bond? Which is something that's helped us enormously, carrying that love in our hearts, learning to fold it in and move forward with it, which, you know, when you're first bereaved, you think that's not possible. How could it be possible? Yeah, I, I think that's it, it's such a 
a beautiful evolution that so many people do feel, but it does feel hard to even articulate because in the beginning, I know we know for so many people it's unimaginable. Um, but that actually sort of dovetails into a, a question that I really appreciate um, Lisa asking of just saying, you know, the hardest thing for her has has been um, that sort of guilt, that feeling like it's okay to live after. A, a child is gone. Um, and I'm curious how uh, how the two of you survived that, because I think something that we don't talk about enough, maybe because we're so scared of the word suicide, <laughs> is that after we lose people, it may not be active thoughts of taking our own life, but that thought of maybe not does deserving to live, not wanting to live, not knowing how to live. I think that's a reality for so many people in grief. And um, yeah, I just wonder how how you um, found that place of the permission you gave yourself to live in a world without Josh. It's a tough question and it's a tough one to answer because, you know, we were very lucky to have other children but I am so aware of people who've not had children or who have no surviving children who have struggled with how to move forward. You know, in a way for us, we had other kids. They weren't young, but they were there. And we pulled together as a family. We felt that pressure to be available for them and to somehow model some sort of hope because they were traumatized. But of course, siblings, our kids thought that their grief was less important than ours. And of course, that doesn't help anyone. Um, and so, you know, finding a way forward was difficult because Josh wasn't there. And so we had to find out who we were without him. But starting the charity, The Good Grief Project and making films and being active and running our retreats and writing a book has helped us to find meaning again. And this is the thing about creativity, isn't it? You know, by writing, by it doesn't have to be, it's not about being an artist, it's about being active, intentional. You know, even writing someone's name on a pebble and just putting it out there on a hillside is a creative act, isn't it? Um, anything that feels okay, we went to Mexico and made a film there as well, but we didn't actually cut it into this film. We made a separate film about the Day of the Dead because we had this thought that maybe we would find answers there. But what we found was really interesting because yes, in a way, grief was more openly expressed and it was more colorful and it was more out there, but people still felt the same level of isolation and the, and the parents that we interviewed felt exactly like us. And it was beautiful the way we were embraced and they celebrated Josh and the Muertos ritual was very much about bringing Josh into the room. But we felt that there was no miracle answer. And, and, and we still feel that when we went to Vietnam, it was the same. It's about just being open to what's going on within you and trying to move forward step by step, breath by breath. Yeah. I don't know what you think, Jimmy, about that. Um, we were quite surprised actually on the day of Josh's funeral um, that um, we all gathered together in the living room after after seeing his body go into the crematorium. Um, we all sat down and watched Mamma Mia. <laughs> uh, it, the, a, no tragedy comes without a certain amount of humour. Um, even for us in those dark, dark days, there were some pretty gruesome jokes going around as well. Dark humour. Um, so... I don't know. I it is. I, I I don't know how. In that sense, I I the first time I laughed, or the first time that you know that that you know I I smiled and sort of you know thought that life had somehow or other you know was still worth living. Um, I don't think that personally I have have ever had any really serious suicidal ideations. I know it's been there, um, but for me. It's 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 not it's not been a, a, a big a big issue. If only because, as Jane says, we have two other children, and and um, you know that would be yeah too much for for them to have to have to have to live with. 
Um, but we've worked with so many people who are suicidal yeah. and it comes up on our retreats, quarter of the parents are bereaved through suicide, you know, and the age gets younger and younger. And, and that, that's really tough. Well, yeah, I guess there is a moment, though, when, you know, in the sense in which you, um, you know, you, we are obviously still hugely sad and um, terribly sort of, I, I think to an extent we're still quite traumatised by the fact that our, our middle son has not, is not here. Um, you know, there's still moments every single day and most days in as i wake up in the morning i will have a certain sort of you know, sort of anxiety that is a, a, a low level anxiety that says that life is really as it should be because you know josh isn't out there in the world doing his music and and you know diving sort of barrier reefs and things like that somewhere <laughs> um and, and and so so that that's always there um but but I, I don't know that I can explain exactly how it is that, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, yeah, you laugh and you, you know, you drink, you, you, you still have relationships with other people and, you know, we can, we can, you know, we can, you know, well, sometimes we can party and we do party. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's really interesting though is in our book, you know, there's quite a few people who've been bereaved through suicide, that their child took their lives and, um, you know, they talk about what it feels like to be left behind after their child has gone, has decided to take their lives. And, you know, we work with that a lot and creativity and being active really helps with that. And we noticed that on our retreats, we have boxing workshops and people always say, I oh, know that's not for me. Well, my word, you know, as you can imagine, <laughs> it works. Just somehow externalizing the pain huge heavy weight in your heart that hole in your heart through physical exercise for me it was running that kept me going you know I, I would have a release from the terrible sort of I suppose overwhelming sort of block that I felt in the early stages of my grief and certainly on the retreat people talk a lot on our, ret our residential retreats they talk a lot about that sense of being freed up through being with others taking the mask off talking freely about what it really feels like at times not to want to live. And it really does help to be with other bereaved parents and or siblings because we are, our, our retreats work over a, a two-day period from Friday evening through to Sunday afternoon. And on Saturday evening, um, we have a, a, a little moment when people choose a piece of music that, that, that is resonant with their, with, with, um, with their grief or something that helps them. Um, it, you know, sort of tell a story about about their child, and often um, that that evening uh, will descend into not I say descend, but uh, it, will, it will it 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 becomes quite party ish. So you know, there's laughter and there's partying and there's you know dancing and you know it's it's, it's quite nice. And um, Jane's often remarked about the fact that if if somebody from Mars came down and, and looked at <laughs> you know had had the overview of what was going on on this bereavement weekend and saw these people gaily um, you know sort of, um, dancing, um, it, it would um, they might yeah, think they it was a party. They, they might think that it was just a, a regular. <laughs> Um, I just, you know, I want to add, I just, I just shared in the chat a, a quote that is from a psychologist named Joseph Casper, who's a bereaved parent. And he, you know, this quote and this concept that, that he coined makes me, so much of what you do um, in sort of Josh's memory makes me think of this idea that he talks about of what he attributes as the thing that allowed him to survive after his son's death um, was this idea of what he called co-destiny. And he says, you know, I had this moment where he says this awareness that I could add goodness to my son's life by doing good in his name motivates me to this day. And he talks about sort of this idea that every um, everything he does now is because his son existed, is because, you know, his son um, influenced who he is and sort of that 
that good he puts in the world now extends his son's life and goodness in some way. And I think, you know, I, I think about what you all do and I don't think it has to be grand things, right? Like you've done amazing things. I think oftentimes it's, it's tiny things. I think sometimes it is saying, at least for me, I think certainly that idea that my co-destiny in some way is to put, put things in the world because those people who aren't here anymore, who were part of my life, were part of my life. And so I, I think that sometimes I hear over the years with bereaved parents, many times who have only, who only had one child who died, that that has been part of what gets them through is that idea that even if it is the tiniest thing that they do in the world each and every day because of their child, that that extends the goodness of their life. Um, and I, I really, you know, I really appreciate the idea of co-destiny, but I think it really connects to so much of what the two of you do as well. And I, I saw a question that I know we're running up on time and I want us to be able to, there's so many great questions, um, share how people, we had several people who want to be able to share the movie with others and with groups that came in. I want to get to that, but I did have one question that ties to your book that I, I wanted to highlight. And someone asked a good question of how the evolution came of focusing on sort of a narrow subset of grievers with bereaved parents more in the in the film and then expanding a bit in the book to others. And I was wondering if you could share a little of that evolution. So yeah, so the, the book, that's the book there, When Words Are Not Enough, it it's it's interesting because it's 10 years in the making. And it, we we I certainly found that we were learning so much from other bereaved people all the time. Whether they'd lost a child or a partner, it was usually around sudden unexpected loss. And the trauma, because you can't not be traumatized, um, the trauma brought with it so many stories and connections. Um, and we wanted to do something around, around those in the book, you know, capture different stories and illustrate them with photographs. And the idea was that the, the, the book could be open to any page because when you're in, as most people will know here who've been bereaved, when you're in the early stages of grief, you can't think, you can't function. Your neural pathways are, I mean, everything's like spaghetti. And so we wanted to create a visual book that you could open at any page. It wasn't a film. It wasn't something that had to be begun at the beginning and ended at the end. Open it at any page and there's something that you can hang on to and connect with about lived experience of somebody who's lost a child to cancer or suicide, or it, it doesn't really matter, or a partner. It's not so much how the person died, it's how they carried on. How did they find meaning again? And so the book was in a way very therapeutic. Certainly for me, it, 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 it was like the end of a 10 year exploration. And when I pick it up, I just feel this sense of, this is 10 years. This book is honoring our son and everyone else we've met along the way who, I mean, we've met the most inspirational people from all around the world. And I'm just in awe of the courage because we know that it takes courage to work this through. And I mean, I'm a therapist, so I work with people regularly who don't know how to work it through. And as they begin to discover how to work it through, then there is a, you can be, almost begin to breathe again. But for a lot of people, breath is on hold. You're paralyzed for a very long time. And then physically you get ill. Grief will find its way out, either psychologically or physically through illness or through panic attacks and anxiety. So we actually have to embrace it. So we wanted to make it easier. And the book, I hope, does that, as we hope the film does too. Our films, yeah. quite a few of them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we, we do talk about this notion of an intentional grief. In other words, that if you are proactive and sort of, you know, attend to your grief in, in a way that's more conscious rather than just letting it ride all over you, um, then somehow or other that's a, that's, a, that's a healing process that's going to be more fruitful. 
Um, for me, I, 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 I'm not, I, I think that in a way, all, all of the things we've done, whether or not it starts from um, a photographic book that I made in six months after Josh died, um, through to the work with the Compassionate Friends, um, through to e evolving um, the work of the of the, um, of the of the of the weekend retreats. Um, that that's that's actually sort of more of an organic process. I, I I don't know that I give it an awful lot of thought about what the outcome of anything any any particular project would be. Um, I mean that's in tune with with my instincts to as a, as a documentary filmmaker anyway, um, in the sense mm -hmm. in which you don't know what the end of the story is going to be when you start filming. You know, with 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 you you, you start the cameras start rolling. Um, and, and I think that's how it should be, because that's what life is. Um, life is, is, you know, stuff that you don't know what's around the corner. Um, um, so f for me, um, while, um, it, it, and I, I also need to have some kind of a project going as well. So we have the book and, you know, um, I know that Jane's getting a little bit <laughs> sort of tired now, but and we actually haven't got anything going at the moment, um, except for... <laughs> Oh, yes, we have. We have. We got a fundraising trip. From, I'm going to climb Kilimanjaro for those who might be interested. Um, I'm going to be one of the older British persons who have climbed um, Kilimanjaro uh, this coming October. That, that, that's sort of taken me away from um, any more. <laughs> No. That's a, that is that is something big to have going on. Yes, <laughs> I, think, I think we could say that's something. I think what um, she mentioned was he's doing it to raise funds for the the, the yeah, active um, grief retreats because you know what we I'll like to be, what we like to yeah. be able to do is to offer anyone who wants to come on our retreats a bursary if we can. So it's open to everyone. It's really important that people come on our weekend retreats. You know, anyone can come. And I like the idea of journeys as well. Yeah. Anything that involves a journey. And, you know, I mean, grief is a mountain to climb. Yes. Absolutely. So, yeah. There's another yeah, mountain. Another um, well, I put the, um, yeah, I put the link to the book because someone just asked about that. Lori, I will absolutely keep the chat up. And I will also, when we share the QA of this, um, I will also pull out um, the resources, things that people shared in the chat, um, because I want people to be able to capture all of, of what was in here. Um, we are going to be looking at for opportunities with What's Your Grief to um, be able to talk a little more, maybe do an interview for the website with um, Jimmy and Jane to share in an article. So I will also, I know we didn't make it to every question, but I, if there's some that I can weave in there, I will. The big question I know that a number of folks have asked about is just accessing the film, if they, there's some folks who have bereaved parent gr support groups that they meet with and others who they wanted to share with and wanted to know about accessing the film, we will share details on that in the follow-up email. But if you all wanted to share now any information, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Well, as long as the links are down there, um, and if, if 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 people want to organise a group screening of the film somehow or other, then yeah, um, um, yeah write to us, write to us, and, yeah, and then we can we can um, you know um, find some way of, of giving you license for the film. We'll 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 reply to people who you know everyone. I mean, I know there's so many amazing questions, and it's impossible to get to them all. We will take it upon ourselves to respond to people. Uh, it's really important to us to have this conversation. Our films and books are available via Amazon in the US and in the UK, and any bookshop can order them, you know, so we're, we're, we're out there. It's just as a, as a very small charity with a very big reach, we don't have a lot of time to promote our films and books. And it really, really helps us to get reviews as, as Lutza will know herself, because they have a wonderful book at What's Your Grief. The reviews really help to get the book out there in the public domain. So anyone who wants to read our book or review our films, please do, because that seems to be what makes people discover them. I don't know how it all works, but that's how it works, isn't it, Lutza? I know. And I was going to say, someone asked, how can we get your film on Netflix so that <laughs> lots of people so that it can reach a broader audience? And so if anyone um, has connections at Netflix, I mean, I think we can start there. Now that you've seen it, 
um, send it to your Netflix connections. But I do think it does make such a big difference the reviews when people have, have seen things. So when we send out the links um, with all the details, we'll also send the links where you can review things because it really does help tremendously. Um, well, I know we have gone a little over time and I appreciate Jimmy and Jane so much you spending all this time with us and allowing us to be able to show the film and having it reach so many folks um, from our, our What's Your Grief audience. So thank you so, so, so much. Um, I'm going to put your the Good Grief Project, Jane and Jimmy's uh organization charities website up in the chat again but as i have said i will include we'll do one nice email tomorrow that has all the follow-up of everything so you can get all the details in one place of how to learn more about the other films the retreats the books um and then uh i think many of you are on the what's your grief um, newsletter list but we'll certainly um, be sending some more information there. Hopefully if we can get an interview together that, to do some follow-up uh, with more information about the book and some of their other projects. So Thank you so much. And, and Litza and Eleanor, for all the work you do, What's Your Grief is such a brilliant, brilliant thing for so many people. And I know that, you know, what we do and what you do and what so many other people do does provide a lifeline for people who think there is a right way to grieve. Well, there isn't a right way. We just do the best we can. And the most important thing, I think, is to be gentle with ourselves and be kind with ourselves and try and still that critical voice that you know, goes around our heads so often. Absolutely. Thank you and thank yes. you so much to everyone who's taken part and shared and who's struggling one yes. day at a time, one breath at a time. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all so much. And I will leave the chat. I know some people were asking about the chat and going through it still. I will leave the chat up for 10 minutes after we close out for anybody who's still combing through some of these things um, and we'll be here. But thank you so much to everyone and uh, have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.